And tonight, guys, I'm going to be doing part two, I believe it is, of something that I call an atomic Bible study, where we're just going to go through a much more forensic kind of look from Scripture to Scripture to Scripture. I'm not going to do a lot of preaching tonight. I am going to do a lot of teaching. I, I don't have a strong preaching suit anyway. I can preach, but I'm not a major preacher. I like to teach is what I like to do. I like to tell stories right on, and that definitely goes into the preaching part. But, but I want to tell you, I, I love the Word of God. And I have such a high regard for the Word of God, and I'm always convicted about my regard for the Word of God. Like, and it's not just like, man, I, I feel like I need to read more so that I'll be a better boy, but it's like, it's available to me, and it's not available to so many people. And every time, how in the world can you not have a right mind if your mind is full of the Word of God? It's impossible. And I promise, just twist off and go without reading the Word for a while, and then, and then you'll be trying to pick up all the pieces of the bad decisions that you make for the next several years over a very short time of your life. And it wasn't necessary at all, because the Word of God is a light to you. And I'm talking, of course, about the written Word of God that is leading us to the spoken Word of God, which introduces us to the living Word of God. Amen. And you need to know the difference between those three. But the reason that we look in the scriptures is that we're looking for the Holy Spirit to show us Jesus. And that's not just in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the four gospels, which, which, which consequently we are actually going to be looking at tonight, uh, specifically the book of John. But it's not just that. All of the scriptures testify of Jesus one way or another. It's the job of the scriptures to testify of Jesus. And it's like how to walk with Jesus, how to live with Jesus, how to hear Jesus, how to be a part of his kingdom, how to recognize Jesus, all those different things. And guys, we have to know the Bible for that. There's no substitute for it. There's really not. And so tonight, we're going to be looking in John chapter 18, and I'm going to tell you what started all this here tonight. It was today, a very good friend of mine went to a trial, and we've been waiting on this trial for three years. It's a very big deal, and this guy's a very good friend of mine. And he's in trial, and I don't want to go off into the court case, but it's actually kind of a famous court case. And it's going on in Dallas uh, City right now, and it happened today, and it will continue to go on um, for at least another day or two. And it's something that we've been praying about and believing God for for a long, long time. Again, without going off into any of it, because it's a very, very political trial. It's extremely political. And there's been a lot of injustice that has been involved in this from the very beginning. There's terrible, terrible injustice. And in the midst of all that, yeah, man, you guys turn off your phones and put your guns on safety. Will y'all do that for me, please? Thank you. And whenever we, whenever we, um, over, over the past three years we've been praying about this, what well, finally happened today, and it's still going to happen again tomorrow. And we were I was talking to him yesterday about it, and I said, hey, man, are you nervous about this trial? And he said, well, man, I am a little bit because it's just real that I'm finally here. And I told him this. I said, brother, you already know the Lord's verdict. You already know where Jesus is. You already know what the truth is in this matter. You already have seen the Lord surround you with people that love you, that bless you, that encourage you, that know exactly what happened because it's all on tape. And the guy was just, just, just. It just happened during the midst of the big woke wave. It's like, listen, and Jesus is never woke, ever. Ever. Jesus is never woke, period. And so it's like, okay, so all that happened. Listen, you know the truth. You know what's real. You know your heart. You've seen what Jesus has done. So this is what you need to do. When you go into that court, you need to know this. You're not the one on trial. The judge is on trial. And you get a front row seat to see if he lines up with the Lord or not. And I told him, I said, you know, whenever Jesus came before Pontius Pilate, it wasn't Jesus that was on trial. It was Pontius Pilate that was on trial, and the brother failed. When Jesus was before Caiaphas, it wasn't Jesus that was on trial. It was Caiaphas. And he failed. When Jesus was before Herod, it wasn't Herod that was on, it wasn't Jesus that was on trial. It was Herod and he failed. And when he came before the religious leaders of the Jews, it wasn't Jesus that was on trial. 
It was that group of men, and they failed. So pray for your enemies, and pray that they get it right, because you're gonna be sitting on the front row tomorrow to see how it's all gonna go down. I wouldn't worry about yourself one bit. I would pray for your enemies in this trial and pray that they get it right. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty bold talk from a one-eyed fat man, as they said in Rooster Cogburn, and, and True Grit, and, and you know, it's, it's easy to say that, but it's actually, it's actually difficult to grasp that mindset unless you're full of the Word of God. The Word of God will absolutely transform your mind. It will totally change your mind. And so today, guys, we're going to look at the trial of King Jesus, and we're going to look at, I call this Who's on Trial, but it's an atomic Bible study, and it starts at John 18, and it looks like this. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the, over to the, over the brook, brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. You know, it's one thing for somebody to commit adultery on his wife. It's another thing for, for a man to commit adultery on his wife in his wife's special place. I, I have a very good friend of mine that dealt with her husband cheating on him, cheating on her for years. But when she found out that her husband had taken his girlfriend to their special restaurant and to their favorite hotel, she said, I'm done. I have no more hope. <laughs> and it is one thing to commit adultery. It is a whole nother level of backstabbing when you commit adultery in your wife's favorite place. I got y'all's attention. I've only, I've only gone through one verse, and we got a lot of verses to go through. There's 40 in this first chapter, and it's like this all the way through it. And it's like, dang. Well, this was the special place of King Jesus, the special place with his disciples. And as you leave east from Jerusalem, you go down through the Kidron Valley, you come up onto the Mount of Olives, and there was actually an oil press that was there, a place where you press and you make olive oil. And this was their place, and it was a garden, which means it was, it was guarded. It, you couldn't see from the outside in. It was an intimate place, a special place. And that is the place where Judas decided to ambush Jesus. That level of betrayal might not mean very much to the, to the casual readers of the Word of God, but it meant a lot to John who wrote this. It meant a lot to him. So verse 3 says, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, he came there with, everybody say, lanterns, torches, and weapons. Okay, three different degrees <laughs> Three different degrees of a mob. And there's a huge Bible study that you can do with that. And anytime that you see three different groups, or there's the sun and the moon and the stars, or if it's past, present, and future, or if it's uh, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or if it is Ham, Sham, and Japheth, or if it is faith, hope, and love, or in this case, if it is lanterns, tortures, and weapons, it means the whole nine yards. Every form of treachery that you can possibly imagine comes with this evil spirit that is with him. Uh, when when uh, Connie was helping me with these notes today, and I said, look up that word, and it's Strong 3697, the word weapons, and it means tools to make war, or it means instruments for committing unrighteousness. We are like, dang, <laughs> that's awesome. Verses four through eight says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that was going to happen to him, he went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? Okay, he leaves the disciples and steps forward away from them before the rest of the disciples knew that this was going down. Jesus knew that, and he came over and he says, who y'all looking for? And they answered him and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Stop. John stops talking about what was going on, and he said, by the way, you need to know that when this mob showed up in our secret favorite place with our secret favorite person in the entire universe, 
When they showed up and they came there with, with every form of treachery that you can possibly imagine in our very special place, that you need to know the person that was leading them was actually Judas. Now that's interesting that he would put it right here because then he stops and then he goes on to say, now when Jesus had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus answered and said, I told you that I'm he. Therefore, if you're looking for me, that means you gotta let them go their way that the saying might be fulfilled, might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. All right, I wanna stop and, and tell you that, that he's actually the writer of the book of John is actually trying to convey that Jesus is in full control and authority of the situation that is happening in the garden. This did not surprise him. He knew it was going to happen. He went forward and met them before any of the disciples had a clue it was even going down. And then when he walked over to him, he said, who are you looking for? And he says, I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And at the words, I am, they fell over backwards. So you think that it got those dudes' attention? The power of God hit them and the dudes fell over backwards. Then he went over. He's like, dude, get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more time. Who are you looking for? And they're like, Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes, okay, listen, I already told y'all that I'm that guy. And you know what that means? You're here for me, but you're not for none of them. And he, it's like the Jedi mind trick. He's like, you will let them go. And they're like, we will let them go. And they go. <laughs> so it's, when you get to looking at this narrative and going, whoa, 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 and what's in the book of John that's not in the other four gospels, and what's in the other three gospels, rather, that's not in the book of John, which we're about to cover some of those things, it's the point that John wants to make here is this. Number one, this was our special place. And that demoniac devil from hell that fell from, the, that fell from a tree like Jezebel and split wide open, and we were happy to see that day, which is how the book of Acts begins, talking about the demise of Judas. He said, do you know where he showed up? He showed up in our secret place. That was sacred space to us. That was a holy place to us. And furthermore, when he did, Jesus was in 100% control of the whole situation. You know, when I see the events that happened in John chapter 18 and the trial that is about to take place, and as the night continued and how bad it actually got and how dark it got before he was led away to the cross the next day. And so look at that. One of the things that you can't see is Jesus failing. He doesn't fail for his friends. He doesn't fail for his father. He's in full control of the entire situation and he refuses to be overcome by any scenario that is presented to him. Aren't you glad that you have Jesus in your life? Yeah, I do too, man, in a really big way. So Judas is among those bad guys in the midst of the betrayal of Jesus, using an act of intimacy, the garden, and then, of course, the friendship of a kiss as the betrayal. Now, the reason why I need to bring that up is because John doesn't. Now, it's in Matthew it's 26 verses 48 through 49. Now he betrayed, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, whoever it is, the one I kiss, you go ahead and you seize him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and he said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. It's also in the book of Mark, Mark 14, 44, it's 444 scripture. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whoever I kiss, he's the one, seize him and lead him safely away. And then it shows up in the book of Luke. In Luke 22, verse 47, it says, And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Hey, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? But there's no mention of the kiss in the book of John. And it was apparently important enough that the other three writers of the other three Gospels, like, that's a really big deal. I need to tell you this. I want to just tell you, out of all of the disciples, there's nobody, more in, there's nobody who intimately knows Jesus more than John. And that part made his skin crawl so much, he wouldn't write it down. Have you ever just had something that just made your skin crawl where you're like, I'm just going to just skip that altogether? That goes to show you how much whom this disciple, whom John calls himself, all the way through the disciple until the last couple of lines, the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
And like the thing he wants to show is everybody is this dude is God and he loves me. And the conclusions that we come to from these things is apparently he really does love all of us. That is amazing. But when it comes to the Judas kiss, he just passes that plate right up and says, let's move on. That tells me how bad it hurt him. So Jesus is in full control. He fulfilled scriptures, whole nine yards. And then let's see here, where are we at now? Oh, by the way, whenever, <laughs> whenever all this takes place, which is, which is crazy cool, there is this story, and we're about to read it here, where actually Brother Peter, who has a sword on him, which what does that say about Jesus the hippie that you've been taught? That his disciples were armed. What does that say to you about, well, men of God shouldn't be armed? I am right now. And you can kiss my grits. Hallelujah if you don't like it. All right, so with that said, if, if I'm going to tell you that, what does it say to you that Jesus, the peacemaker, had disciples with him that carried arms? Does that change your mind a little bit about what your perception might be about what Jesus brought and, and how he actually brought it? Well... Brother Peter, <laughs> he, he does this crazy thing, and he pulls out his sword, and he says, uh, I'm going to cut somebody's head off. And that's, this is in verse 10. Simon Peter, having a sword, he drew it, and he struck the high priest's servant, and he cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Okay, when I was reading this today and I was looking at this, because at this time where Jesus is in full control, Peter's not sure that Jesus is in full control. <laughs> and it may have been also that Peter is like, okay, this is the place where Jesus is going to step up and become the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I want to be first in line. This is the place where he's going to start destroying the... the the present day religious system and that we got two high priests and it's actually just a thing of who's married into what family. The fact that Herod is the king and he's not even a Jew, he's an Edomite, which means he's a descendant of, of uh, Esau. Esau became Edom, he was actually Nephilim, he changed it into something else and his descendants are called Edomites. And it's like, okay, so wow, and, 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 Herod, and Herod's a monster, and he kills children and he builds cities like all the Gergeshites do. That's what, that's what Herod does. He's the builder of cities and he's the destroyer of people. That's what Nimrod, the original Nimrod did. And he's just like all the rest of those cats. And it's like, okay, he's gonna rise up, man. He's gonna judge that mess and it's gonna be awesome. And actually what Jesus does is he reaches down and he picks up the ear of Malchus and he puts the ear back on the side of the brother's head. Now that is incredible to me as well, because Jesus is making the point, no dude, I'm still in control. But I wonder what kind of point it had made to Brother Malchus, who had fallen over backwards at the word of I am, and then had his, had his ear cut off, and then had Jesus put it back on, and Jesus is like, take me in, let's go. Wow, wowzers. When I look at that, when I think about that, I think it is absolutely incredible. Now, here's what's amazing. What's amazing is that act of Malchus having his ear put back on is not mentioned by John. John tells the part that Peter cut it off, but he doesn't mention that Jesus put it back on. And the reason why he doesn't is because it's going to mess with the narrative because there's an important part that John wants to make that none of the other guys make. And it was this, there was a family member of Malchus who recognized Peter when Peter was standing there acting like, you know, he was one of the bad guys. And the family member of Malchus said, didn't I see you cut off my cousin's ear? And we're about to read that. And it's like, okay, what does that have to do? Because the reason why he didn't mention 
the fact that Jesus had reached down and put it up is because he would have to explain the, conf the confusing element of, yeah, you did see his ear get cut off, but you, also Jesus, but you also saw Jesus put it back on. And I don't want to have to spend 25 paragraphs explaining what a bunch of knuckleheads these people actually are. So it's like, I'm just not even going to mention it. I just want to point out the fact that Judas is one of the guys that pointed out Peter, and, and a cousin of Malchus is one of them. Now, why do you think that years and years and years after this event, when the book of John is being written, that he would mention his name Malchus? And I want to tell you why I think. Because the Christians knew Malchus. I think it means years and years later, at the time that the book of John was written, he calls him by name because he was famous among Christians, which means he was actually a Christian. And that brother loved King Jesus, and his testimony was that Peter had cut his ear off, but Jesus had put it back on. You're like, well, Pastor Story, that's just speculation. What's not speculation is that John, in his day, thought it was important that the people who read the letter in his day knew who it was. Well, if they didn't know who he was, then why would he name him? Amen. Look, I told y'all it was a different way of, of preaching tonight. Amen. Are you guys still with me? Oh, yeah. Amen. It's just, a, it's just a really cool Bible study, and I like it. So, uh, John chapter 18, verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into his sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? To drink the cup literally means to deal with the hand that is dealt. So we use that term today. Hey, man, you deal with the hand that was dealt to you. That's a poker term, which comes from old school hillbilly Texas, right? So, right, so before they had poker terms, they used drinking terms for this same harsh reality. And it was this. No, you drink from the cup that was handed to you. And he said, look, this is the holy cup that my father handed to me. Shall I not drink from it? And he's like, what are you going to do? You going to save me from God? Peter, you trying to save me from God again? Would you please stop that? That, that whole thing to me is also fascinating that, that we can actually get zealous in our acts and we can try and save each other from Jesus. Oh, don't go on that mission trip. Don't go. I'm going to defend you to the death, sister. I'm going to defend you. You got to protect yourself. Hey, don't go to that dangerous church, man. Somebody might get sick. Hey, what are you? Yeah, you do me a favor and don't try and save me from Jesus. Shall I not drink from the cup that the Father gives me? Amen. These are all, throughout the years, as I've read John 18, these are all things that I'm sharing with you that have had profound impacts on me. Where I've just been, man, this, these things really have rattled my cage throughout the year. Verse 12. So then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews, they arrested Jesus, they bound him, and then they led him away to Anna first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, which that's a whole system that's jacked up. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. What? Okay, today, whenever, whenever I was going through this verse, I was like, whoa, whoa, stop. I don't want to just read that and act like I know what that means, because I was like, I don't know what that means. Let me read it again. Now, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Okay, one of the things that I can tell you about John's writing style is he likes to give people credit for things, good and bad. So when he writes, he's constantly saying, now, you do need to know Judas was among those guys, and you do need to know that Caiaphas is the guy in John chapter 11, verse 53, that said, hey, what's real is, we need to actually kill this guy. He was the one that actually started, um, started it among the religious leaders saying, we need to outright kill this guy. And he said it this way, and uh, let me put it to you. It says this. He basically says murdering one person is a small price to pay for maintaining the status quo. That's basically what he says. And he's like, look, this guy's going to cause a big insurrection, and then the Romans are going to be mad at us, and they're going to punish us for it. So let's just kill him and put him to death, and let's, let's, and let's get it over with. It was, Caiaphas, it was Caiaphas that started that narrative among the religious leaders. Now, for those of y'all that don't know, and I, and I have already stated it, but I'm going to say it one more time. 
When John says the Jews are the bad guys here, he's not talking about the Jewish people because Jesus is also a Jew. The disciples are also Jews. And then, of course, the Italians and then everybody else, they got a hold of this verse and they said, well, that means it's okay for us to exterminate Jews because the Bible tells us that the Jews are the bad guys. It is a terrible translation because what it actually means is the religious leaders of the Jews. They're like, okay, well, then the religious leaders within the Judea religious system. Obviously, the 5,000 people were a mix of Jews and Gentiles that Jesus fed. They were up in, you know, up in north of Galilee. Obviously, the people that Jesus healed, they were Jews. The people that fed him, the people that took care of him, they were Jews. The Jews are not the bad guys, the religious system. Actually, every system that is presented in the book of John is the bad guy. He's not much for systems. He's into the kingdom. Right? Okay. So Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, verse 15, as they come into this place where the religious leaders are. And now that disciple was known to the high priest, and he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Okay, there's actually an argument among scholars. Is it talking about Judas, or is it talking about John? If it's talking about John, then it means John was known by the high priest, but I don't think it was John. There's a lot of people who argue over really frivolous things. I was listening to... Uh, one of my Bible studies I listen to nearly every day is something called the Naked Bible Podcast. I'm like, what is that? It's Dr. Michael Hauser, and he's one of the greatest theological minds I've ever come across in my whole life. He recently passed a day. He recently passed away, and today I was listening to one of his podcasts, and they're talking about the book of Jonah, and you know that in academic circles and among academia, there's this huge argument that people argue once you get educated, and it's this, was, did Jonah actually happen or is, it a, or is it an allegory? And I'm like, I've never been around anybody in my life that didn't think, that believed the Bible that didn't think that Jonah wasn't a real story. Like really, that is something people argue about in college. Many times college is a waste of your time. And all you're gonna pick up is a culture there that's straight up demonic. Sometimes even in Bible colleges tell me that Jonah was not eaten by a well because you can't wrap your head around it? It's because you're weak and you have lazy faith. Amen. That's ridiculous. Is Nineveh a real place? Did he actually go into Nineveh? Yes, he actually did. Was there actually an eclipse that happened the day that he walked in? Was it the first of Elul? Yes, it was. Was 40 days later not Yom Kippur? Yes, it was. Did they not repent? Yes, they did. But the first part of that involves a big fish, so we just can't believe it. What a bunch of limp-wristed knuckleheads have no business whatsoever teaching the Word of God, but that's just my opinion. Come on. Did the flood actually happen? Is the creation story really real? Well, dude, are you standing here? Uh, give me a break. Why would people of God argue these things? Well, because Jesus called Jonah a sign. Yeah. He says, no other sign will be given to you except for that of Jonah the prophet, the prophet Jonah. And so they say, obviously, it was just a prophetic allegory. D do not. <laughs> People waste their time with so many crazy things. So Simon Peter, so Simon Peter he actually follows Jesus. But this is now the disciple was known to the high priest, and he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. And then, I think it tells you who it is, but Peter stood at the door outside, and then the other disciple, the one that they were just talking about, the one who knew the high priest, he went out and he spoke to the girl who keeps the door. Okay, well if the next one says, the girl said, hey, aren't you one of the disciples? What do you think that joker said to her walking out the door? He said, you know that that dude's one of them, right? Well, that ain't John. <laughs> and people have argued for centuries and centuries if that's John or if that's Judas. That's crazy to me. All right, because he walks out and says, hey, I got to tell you something. He doesn't say what he says, but it says what the girl's response was, was, hey, I know you. You're one of them, their disciples. All right. And then, of course, Peter said, oh, no, that's not me. Thank you. 
Now, verse 18, now the servant and the officers who made a fire of coals stood out there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them, and he warmed also himself. Now they got a fire going. Verse 19, then the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. So I want to know about your people. I want to tell you, one of the things that happens when the government shows up and says, hello, I'm here to help, one of the things that he's going to ask is a list of the people that go to your church. Right? Just like they did in, in Seattle, Washington, to my good friend Darren Stott, the city said, we want a list of every single person that has come to your church in the last two years in the name of contact tracing. And he told them, no, I'm not going to do that. And they went, no, you will. And he suffered all kinds of terrible persecution over it, and the city came in and did terrible things to his church, and PBS did a documentary about this hateful guy that was ground zero for spreading the disease all over Seattle, was those dadgum Christians that are doing that, and went through all that mess. Well, they're like, hey, give me a list of your disciples who want to know who they are, who's your top 12, okay, who's your next, who's your next top 70, right, who is that group, and we need to know all that, and also, too, tell me exactly what it is that they believe. I need to hear you say the word so that we have something to prosecute against them. And Jesus answered to them, and he said, you know what? I spoke openly to the world, and I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have never said anything. So why do you ask me? Just ask everybody who heard me and heard what I said to them. And then, indeed, they know. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. And the old King James says, Answerest thou the high priest so? That's the first indication that Peter had, that, that atomic slap that they slapped him. It's the first time that Peter had ever seen anything like that happen to Jesus. And it, it's like, you know, the shot heard around the world, right? It's like that. Boom! And he says, you ain't going to talk to him like that. And I cannot imagine the chills and the fear that went through Peter's mind while he's there in that crowd watching this, warming himself by the fire, like, come on, Jesus, step up. You can call fire down from heaven. You're the one who said that you could call down 12 legions of angels. That's 185,000 angels. You can do it. Hey, you're the one that said that you could do this. You're the one that said you could do that. Hey, come on, man, step up. Show them, show them. I'm right here. I still got my sword. Let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But it doesn't go like that. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse throughout the night. This, it plunged. It was like everything changed in that moment when Jesus got slapped for the very first time. So then it says in verse 23, Jesus said, well, look, if I've spoken evil, you tell me how I've spoken evil. And if, I'm, and if I've spoken the right thing, why are you striking me? And Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Simon Peter stood and he warmed himself and therefore they said to him, hey, aren't you also one of those disciples? You are, right? And he denied, said, no, I'm not. Leave me alone. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off. So he mentions it twice and he mentioned Malchus's name. Now he's mentioning a relative of Malchus. And I wonder if John knew him. It's, it's interesting the things that John tells us that the other guys don't tell us. And he comes over and he says, hey, didn't I see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied him again, and immediately a rooster crowed. The last time that I was in Jerusalem, I toured all the gates. And it's, a, it's, a, it's just a great day, man, to go to Jerusalem and say, I want to go to every single one of the gates. I want to look up all the ancient gates, and I want to look them up, and I'm going to go down the Via Dolorosa, and I'm going to do that, and I want to go to the gates, and I want to know biblically and have a Bible study with me. What happened at this gate, and that gate, and this gate, and that gate? And what I learned in doing so, because there was a man that was watching me at this one gate, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here doing a whole tour of all the gates. And he said, how do you know what all the gates are? And I said, well, I looked it up on Google, and I got it right here. He said, oh, Google's got to tell you everything, obviously. He said, let me see that. And he looked at it, and he said, no. And he just took, and I, it was a cool piece of paper I had. 
And he just pulls out his pen and he just starts marking things out and go, no, 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 no. This, 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 that, 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 this, 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 that, that, that. And he said, I've lived here my whole life. I'm a speaker. I'm a historian. I can tell you starting off with this gate and at the end of this gate, if you want me to, I'll come with you for 20 bucks. And I was like, all right, tell me everything that you know about this gate. And he was an old guy. And he just starts talking and 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 talking. And he'd say, look this up, look that up, look this up. He knew dates. He knew everything. And I was sitting there looking up. I was like, dude, you know your stuff? He said, yeah, I know my stuff. It's like 20 bucks. I'll go with you to a couple more of these gates. And I said, okay. Well, he was talking to me about the gates. And when we were over by the gate... The place, you can actually go to the actual place and stand on the ground where this scene took place. And it's the outside court of what was the house of Caiaphas. And when you're standing there, there is a, the walkway and they've uncovered the walkway. The actual steps that they brought Jesus up is there. And while you're standing there, you can look and you can actually see one of the gates. Well, at nighttime, whenever the sun would go down on this walled city, they would close all the gates and it was a really big deal. Now they would leave the little door open inside the big giant gate, right? But they would close the big gates and somebody would guard the little door. And it's like, okay, what's that all about? It's about the enemy not being able to get in except for one at a time and then you can close that door, you can lock it. That little door is called the eye of the needle. And so it's the small door in the midst of the big giant gate that once the sun goes down, if you get caught outside and if you got a camel, say, it's going to be really hard and take tremendous effort to get that camel through that tiny confined space. He's going to have to kneel. They're ornery animals. They're not friendly animals at all. They're not, they're not compliant they're just made for walking real slow for super long distances in a very arid place. And that's why Jesus said it's easier for a rich man to get through, uh, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. He wasn't saying it's impossible for rich people to enter in. He said, you know what it's like? It's like trying to get a camel through that gate at night. It is a butt whooping. I can say that, right? Maybe not, it's late. I'm sorry, Pastor Gloria. I apologize. That was rude. It's, it's, it's tough. And that's what Jesus was saying when, whenever he said, it's easier to get a camel through that. So they closed the gates. Well, in the morning, the gatekeeper, who it's his job to go and open up the gates at the sunrises, which is a big deal because it means all the people who got trapped outside, they're all going to be coming in now and the economy is going to begin. Well, he would blow a trumpet or he would sing a song and he would declare that the gate is open. And what they called that was the rooster crowing. So when it says that after he denied Jesus three times, he heard the rooster crow, it may have been actually a bird, but I bet you anything, it went, man, the sun is coming up and the gates have been opened. And it's not good. It's the dawning of a different day, and I never imagined this terrible day. Something interesting, a lot of speculation in there, but actually a historical fact. So then uh, they led him away. Now he's going to go to this place called the Praetorium. That is actually the governor's palace. We only have about five minutes left. And it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the governor's palace lest they should be defiled because it was Passover and they wouldn't be able to eat at Passover. So what they demanded is that Pilate come out to see him was super early in the morning. And that's not going to put Pilate in a good mood. He has to get up. He has to get dressed because he's got to go out into public. And so when he comes out, he's mad as a hornet. And he's like, what? What do you guys want? And they said, this guy. We want, we want you to deal with this guy. And he says, what accusation do you bring against this man? So he was already inclined not to go along with anything that they said. It was not because he was a good guy. Pontius Pilate was not a good guy, even though the Greek Orthodox Church calls him Saint Pontius Pilate. You know, okay, whatever. It's like the gospel according to Judas. Thank you, Gnostics, demonic Gnostics. Thank you for your amazing contribution. 
They have a book that's called The Gospel of Judas. Yeah. There's all kinds of demonic stuff out there. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to call Judas a good guy. He's the son of perdition is what the Bible calls him. That's what the Bible calls him. And he hit the ground and busted open like a ripe tomato, just like Jezebel did. The Bible says he burst asunder in the midst. And that was Peter wanting you to know he saw his stinking guts. Peter did not like Judas one single bit. And that's how he starts off his really nice sermon in Acts chapter 1. <laughs> he can't just get up there and pick Mat Matthias and say, we need a replacement. He needs to get up there and explain how the brother died. Yeah, it's true. It's in the Bible. It's there. All right. So Pilate answers and says, he called Jesus and said to him, and this is verse 33. I'm going to go to 33. And he says this. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered and said, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Do you remember what Jesus always asks in the place of the Gentiles, which is where the gates of hell are, which is up north, which is at the bottom of Mount Hermon, which is Caesarea Philippi. He's like, who does the world say that I am and who do you say that I am? That's what he's asking Pontius Pilate right here. Hmm. Are you saying that because the world says that? Or are you saying that because you say that? And that's a crazy way to ask him that. And then it says this. He says, and Pilate said, am I Jew? I can't wrap my head around all your Jewish stuff, right? He's like, hey, I don't think about any of that trash. He says, your own nation and your chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus said, well, my kingdom is not of this world. And if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered by the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Okay. What, one of the things that I skipped here just a minute ago is whenever, whenever Pontius Pilate comes out and he asks the question, what accusation do you bring against this man? This is what they tell him. They, said, uh, they say to him in its verse, um, verse 30, if he were not an evildoer, he would not have delivered him up to you. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be bringing him here. If he didn't need a killing, we wouldn't be bringing him here to you. So here's what they're saying to Pontius Pilate. It is self-evident. You just need to find this guy guilty and send him to death. And he's like, really? He's like, yeah, we obviously brought him here to you, right? And then when Jesus asks him, so dude, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, it's self-evident. I'm not causing an insurrection. I didn't come with anybody else but me, dude. And I'm accused of starting an insurrection. I am by myself. It's self-evident. So what you have is you have the bad guys claiming what is self-evident, and then you have Jesus claiming what is self-evident, and now it's going to be up to Pontius Pilate, does he love the truth? Because that's what he asked him. And then it says, it says, <laughs> where am I at here? Verse 35, uh, no. Verse 36, no. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Okay, well, if you're not causing an insurrection, and I think that is pretty self-evident, okay, I'm going to ask you this. Are you saying that you're a king? And Jesus answered, oh, if you're saying I'm a king, you're saying rightly. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth can hear my voice. And then Pilate said to him, well, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I do not find any fault in him whatsoever. It's time for me to close and I only got to verse 38. And I wanted to go through the rest of the trial and I just don't have time for it. But when, when the world tells you this is self-evident and when God tells you no, that's not self-evident. This is self-evident. The only thing that's going to keep you from siding up with the demoniacs of the world is if you love the truth or not. And friends, you are on trial in that moment. It's not the truth that's on trial. It's you that is on trial. When the world tells you, it's self-evident that whatever woke idea that they come across at you, whatever it is, you're like, it's never been like that. It's never going to be like that. And it is not that now, but you are saying it is that. The truth will say, no, you know what the truth is. 
And this is actually self-evident. The only thing that's going to keep you from running with the mob that brings lanterns and torches and weapons is if you love the truth or not. And here's what you can say. Nobody can really say what truth is, Mr. Jesus. I mean, I'm the bringer of truth. You know, we're all the bringer of truth. Yada, 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 whatever. You know, there is no real truth. No, there is real truth. There is real truth. And truth comes in the form of a human being who is God Almighty living in the midst of all of us. And his name is Jesus. And our love for the truth is essential. We must love the truth. There's a, I'll close on this and ask the guys or whoever else is going to be up here to come up. There's a story, if you, if you want to know how Pontius Pilate died, and remember, and it doesn't happen in the book of John, John is so selective as to what he tells us because he wants to make certain points and he doesn't want you to be confused on what the point is. And the point is always Jesus is God and he's in full control. And he loves us. I mean, that's his point. Matthew, his point is always Jesus is a king. Mark, his point is he is a, an amazing servant and an incredible burden bearer. In Luke, he is always the, he is, you know, he's an incredible human being. Luke, the physician, is the only one out of all three of them that says, dude, Jesus put his ear back on. I don't know why these other dudes don't think that's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. I'm a doctor. <laughs> and then John, to John, Jesus is always God Almighty who's in full control. It's craziness to me. Well, remember in Matthew, Judas, uh, I'm sorry, Pontius Pilate is going through this whole, whole mess and he's, he's wringing his hands over it and his wife shows up and says, hey, don't you find this dude guilty? I had a prophetic vision, a prophetic dream of terrible things that we will suffer if you find this dude guilty. Well, I'll tell you, nobody has more influence on Pontius Pilate than Mrs. Pontius Pilate. And shows up and says, hey, no, 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 we're not going to cross this line. Just whatever you got to do. He's like, all right, honey, I'll handle it. I'll handle it. I will. I'll handle it. And he tries to handle it, and then he fails. When in the midst of him failing, you need to know that the reason why they are accusing Jesus of two different things. One is this. They're saying he has started, he's a revolutionary, and we got to kill him for that. And so you know who they choose? They choose Barabbas over Jesus, who was a revolutionary who had caused an insurrection. The other accusation that they brought against Jesus was he says he's the son of God. But, so they're going to find him guilty for that. But you know who they choose? They choose Barabbas. Do you know what bar Abbas means? It means the son of God. The dude's name means I'm the son of God. Simon, son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah. Who do you say that I am? Bar Abbas. His name is, hello, I'm the son of God, and I'm the guy who starts insurrections. And they choose him over Jesus, which is what they are accusing Jesus of. It's exactly like what happens today on the news. The very thing that they're accusing everybody else of, they are so guilty of, and it's self-evident that they are guilty of it. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So Pontius Pilate, he ends up going, well, there's nothing I can do. You know, you, you're done. Bye. And they nail him to a stake, and then they make him carry that stake, and he goes, they nail, they nail him to the cross, you know, we just say the cross, but it's a stake is what it is. And they nail him there. They strip him down completely naked, hang him up naked, nailed to a piece of wood. And then they, they literally gamble over his clothes, just like the prophecy said would happen. Psalms 22. And all this happens and Jesus dies. And then a few days later, Pontius Pilate gets woke up again. And he hates being woke up by these Jewish leaders. And they say, okay, there's a serious problem. Stones been rolled away, brother in there, all kinds of hell going on, madness, madness, madness. And I guarantee you, when Pontius Pilate did not find his body, I guarantee you he was thinking, rut row. I might have made a wrong choice in this situation. 
So I look up all the tradition on what ever happened to Pontius Pilate, and there's some really neat stories that go with Pontius Pilate because he disappears from the biblical narrative. We know that he disappears from history once he moves back to Rome, and it's not 100% sure exactly what happened to Pontius Pilate uh, once he moved back to Rome. But there's lots of traditions and lots of stories. Some say that it was Tiberius, it was King Tiberius, and uh, the other guy, Caligulus. Um, they thought it was him that actually ordered it. But the bottom line is that the tradition is that either Tiberius or another one of the emperors was sick of death and they said, they told him, they said, hey man, word is spreading like wildfire about this Jesus dude and that brother can heal anybody. And there was one place he went, he healed every single person he was at. If we could get him and we can make an offer he can't refuse, you just put him in chains, bring him up here to Rome, I promise you he can heal you. He's the miracle man of Judea. And so he summoned Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of that area, and said, bring me this miracle man, Jesus, so that he can come here and entertain me like Herod wanted him to do. Hey, monkey, jump through my hoops and let me be entertained with all your miracles. And Jesus doesn't answer him one single word. He's like, I don't think so, pal. Of course, he's a king that worships other gods, and the Bible says in three different verses in the Old Testament, God will not speak to a king that worships other gods. So that's, why, that's why he wouldn't speak to Saul. So Herod is a king that worships other gods. God ain't gonna talk to him. Jesus spoke to Caiaphas. Jesus spoke to uh, Pontius Pilate. He spoke to everybody, but he would not speak to Herod. That's a whole biblical principle. It's a spiritual principle. So Pontius Pilate said, well, dude, so sorry, man, but... I can't do it because, you know, I dealt into a piece of wood and hung him up naked and killed him. Like we do, you know, we're Romans, we do that. <laughs> and then what happened is the emperor said, you got a choice, you can either kill yourself or I'm gonna order your death and you ain't gonna like it. And Pontius Pilate killed himself at the order of the government that he served and he chose over the kingdom of King Jesus. Yeah, when his wife came to him and said, we will suffer terrible things because of this. See, he's not the one on trial, Pontius. You are the one that is on trial and you have to love the truth to be on the right verdict. I think out of everything in John chapter 18, to me, that's the thing that stands out the most outside of the amazing character of King Jesus and outside of all those things. I think that one thing, that Jesus is not on trial. If you think, hey man, I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna see if God's word is true. I'm gonna see if God is real. I'm gonna see all that. What's real is he's not the one on trial, you are. And the only way you're gonna be on the right side of the verdict is if you love the truth. So Father God, sir, we pray, God, that you'd make us lovers of truth. God, that we would be the kind of people that our hearts are burned within us and we say, God, we love your truth so much. God, we love, we love your truth more than anything else. Outside of the fog of humanity, the fog of relationships, the fog of money issues, the fog of governments, the fog of media and propaganda and all the mess, outside of the devil's attacks, yada, yada, yada. Lord, make it real that we love what's real, that we love what's true more than anything else. Whatsoever things are true, think upon these things. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare, sir, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And God, that outside of King Jesus, there is no way, and there is no truth, and there is no life. But in Christ is life and life more abundantly. God, that's our prayer. That's our word. That's our declaration. And that's our hope. And I thank you for it, sir, in Jesus' name. Everybody here say together. Amen.